Hello everybody and welcome to a very, very special episode of Career Diaries by Elamed. Um, this time I'm very happy to be joined back with Michelle Lott. Thank you, Michelle, for, for joining me again. Your, your last episode was so popular we had to get you back on. Um, but this time it's actually me that's going to be interviewed. <laughs> So talking about my career story um, in, in medtech and a little bit about how I kind of got to where I am. So Michelle, I, over to you. This is, this is yep. a really different experience for me now. <laughs> Thanks, Elena. I had so much fun last time and I just thought it'd be fun to turn the tables and learn more about you. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Elena is an award-winning talent acquisition specialist in the medical device and IVD market. Uh, having worked with startups through through to global co corporations, Alina is well versed in the challenges associated with attracting and retaining talent in the healthcare world. With over 20,000 LinkedIn followers, she's a superstar on the platform, and she uses this special knowledge to coach and support top talent on how to build a strong personal brand and maximize their career possibilities through branding and interview coaching. So, Aline, Lena, thanks for being our guest star this week. <laughs> Thank you for having me on yeah. my own series. <laughs> so, of course, I know you from LinkedIn and, and vice versa, but when I was kind of preparing for this, um, this interview, I was really fascinated by some of your background. You know, particularly looking at your education, it looks like, you know, You've got a linguistics background, you've done a little bit of balloon modeling and tap dancing. And so tell me more about the fine art of balloon modeling and tap dancing and how you danced your way right into medical device recruiting. Yeah, it's really, it's, um, you know, you, you, when you ask me this question, it makes me realize I do need to go back and revise my, my LinkedIn profile now, but um, it's my, my little secret actually. Um, so. I kind of grew up um, as a child in performing arts and um, I, I was, I always, you know, tried ballet, but was never, I was always that kind of like, you know, clunky kid, you know, never very <laughs> graceful, but something that I was always good at is tap. Um, and it's something that I actually took quite late on into life, like into my early twenties, I was um, doing tap and it was always just, you know, um, a chance to, I don't know, express myself in a different way, I guess. Like I've always been a big fan of kind of like blues, um, jazz, swing music, uh -huh. big band, and um, love putting on some sequins and having a little dance and being the center of attention. So that always worked quite well for me. And um, the balloon modeling was uh, when I was at uni, um, I had like a side job working with kids. So uh -huh. I had to kind of um, develop, you know, um, uh, a skill that would uh, entertain them, let's say. And balloon modeling was one of them, but it's something that, I feel like anyone out there, if you ever want to learn, you know, resilience and bravery, pick up balloon modeling because there's so much that you can learn, <laughs> you know, a certain fearlessness of like, you know, there's nothing like having a balloon pop in your face where you've got, you know, some kids waiting for their balloon sword and it just goes boom and you having to just deal with it. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit kind of my, my secret. Um, but yeah. I think no, you I have the tap dancing to back up in case your balloons popped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was it it was all about keeping kids entertained and that was kind of my side job that I had at uni whilst I was studying languages um okay. and so like everybody always asks me you know like how do you recruit medical devices are you an engineer by background and actually that was not necessarily the case um I I had a love for different cultures and um you can probably tell I just love speaking to people um so when I was at school and it was kind of like what, do, what are you going to choose as a career I chose the option that allowed me to just spend most of my exams speaking which was you know doing languages so I chose um like French and Spanish to to kind of give me the chance to yeah basically just spend most of my exam time talking with people but it, it was great because it gave me the chance to meet different cultures and you know interact with people all over the world I had the chance to do an amazing year abroad you know all that kind of stuff and and that was actually how I got my first job in recruitment um, because I had you know some languages to my background that the company that we're recruiting at the time wanted because they were working yep. in the European market yep I could definitely see that being a strong advantage to a recruiter in the med tech space because languages are such a big part of bringing devices to market. You have to have a whole translation plan, SOPs, you know, the whole nine yards. 
Yeah. Also, also because I think like recruitment is, it, it's, it's an art, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you need to be able to understand cultural differences as well, especially when you recruit in Europe, um, because from one country to the next, even though it's Europe, uh, there are different customs, different cultures, different ways of expressing yourself. And so um, even though I don't speak every single European language, the fact that I speak four kind of gives me already, you know, the ability to, to, to build rapport a little bit, you know, quicker, I find. Right. Um, and, um, you know, that, that was kind of like the, the thing that got me in the door and with the linguistics, you know, it's actually, it's considered to be a science. Um, and, uh, some of my friends, when they would see some of the kind of transformational grammar that, you know, I was studying at uni, they did think I was doing a degree in physics or something, right? Because it, it's, it's like maths equations. Um, but part of it as well was like so, sociolinguistics. How do people communicate with each other? Um, what are the semantics behind that? How do humans interact? And that kind of got me really interested in HR, which kind of led very nicely to yeah. you know, recruitment and um, mm -hmm. kind of the searchy stuff that we do now. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, when you explain it like that, you know, going from the balloons to the tap dancing to the <laughs> languages all makes perfect, perfect sense. So how did you, so we, we go from HR to recruitment, natural fit. How did you take that plunge and go out on your own? I think, um, so, so kind of my story was, you know, I, I joined a, a recruitment company that was very, very well known at the time for um, IT and finance and kind of secretarial support. And what they wanted to do when they hired me was to go into stronger into into Europe, but into something sciencey. And so it, they basically decided to hire somebody, you know, that essentially was not going to be super expensive, you know, that had a lot of energy um, to to start something new. And um, they kind of hired me. And, and when I joined, there were kind of no clients, no candidates, you know, no brand, nobody knew kind of um, who they were. And my job, I didn't know anything different was just basically to build it up. Um, which I did, you know, in my first few years and kind of we built, you know, a team, build a client base. And it got to the point where I just felt that I didn't have as much control over the direction of the company. And um, I, I quite early on was exposed to, to the senior, senior leadership team and felt that, you know, we weren't very aligned with kind of vision, right? And um, I had certain ideas around marketing and certain ideas around content, you know, adding more value to a candidate network, adding more value to our clients, um, having the business less focused on, you know, the, the standard numbers, you know, that, um, mm -hmm. that give recruiters a bad reputation and delivering more of like a, a fully integrated service, you know, that is not just like sending CVs, but actually delivering a good quality service to candidates and clients. And um, it was something that I just felt that I would never be able to, to kind of do within the company where I was. And I'd got to as far as I was going to go there. Um, and it was this, I mean, you'll probably identify with this. It, it was this decision of like, you know, do you kind of be um, a very small, you know, department in a huge organization, even though we were a really successful department. Um, but, but do you do that in a, in more of a corporate environment or do you step out and, you know, be, you know, big fish, small pond and kind of, you know, like take more decisions, take more ownership over, you know, the direction. And for me, the fact that um, I'd already built something up from scratch before and I kind of had this, yeah, like entrepreneurial spirit ever since I was a kid, I was always going to have my own business. It was never a question of like, are you going to have your own business? It was mm -hmm. more, what, what is your business going to be? Um, I just decided to do it, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I remember having a conversation with my, with my parents, you know, the day that, that, especially my dad, um, and, um, marching into their room after probably like going out for a drink after work and saying like, that's it. I've, I'm done. I'm going to start my own business. And my dad was literally like, are you crazy? You know, he always plays it a little bit more on the safe side. Um, you know, why would you do that? It's got so much risk, you know, all these kind of decisions that, that people probably think. Um, but luckily my mum is always pushing me as well. Um, so she was kind of like, if you think you can do it, do it. And so I just took the plunge and never looked back. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure you can identify with this. It's like, yeah, you could have stayed in that, that role, and, but you could have kept producing all of this top quality content that was valuable to you. Mm. But if it's disconnected from this overall corporate structure and them being struck, stuck in traditional metrics, it kills part of your soul too. So it's a little, it, it is a risk to take that plunge, but it's also a different kind of risk to stay. 
you know, and, and, and play it safe, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and a decision, like a question that always kind of like has helped me or is a question that I ask my candidates as well, right? Um, it, when they're trying to make a decision, should I move? Should I accept this job or should I just stay where I am? It's kind of like, if you fast forward five years and you have the option to either be in this new job or, you know, this new environment, um, or you've stayed where you are, you know, what would, what would you regret more, you know, doing it or not doing it? And for me, I, when faced with the question, it was, you know, I knew that I would regret not doing it. I knew that I would regret, you know, doing another five years in a corporate environment that was like quite comfortable. You know, um, I was performing really, really well, you know, within the business. Um, but I knew that, you know, it, yeah, it wasn't everything that I could give and I'm kind of a, an all or nothing kind of person. So it was a no brainer in the end. So something else I noticed when I was like looking on your website, it seems like your entire executive team that works with you is female. Yes. Um, and I really respected that. I wanted to learn a little bit more what your experiences have been like being a woman led business, but yet serving a traditionally male dominated industry. You mean medical devices as a male dominated industry? Mm. Yeah, really interesting. Um, I, I kind of forget that we are a female dominated leadership team if that makes sense um because it is kind of just what it is and it, it wasn't intentional you know I think one one thing that is true you know we have struggled we we did hire a couple of guys um into the team but we have struggled to attract men to the business <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know why if there's anyone out there listening that's interested in joining Elamed give me a shout <laughs> but um you know I think it's I think it's really refreshing um what can I say? I think we, we, the leadership style is a little bit different, right? Um, you know, definitely in terms of the way that, you know, we make decisions, I would say, but, um, the way that the business is actually run, um, is, is for me irrelevant if you're male or female, it's, you know, the way we run the business is very much like data driven objective, you know, but maybe, um, taking, you know what we don't have is that kind of like lad culture that we see sometimes present in a lot of male dominated recruitment companies you know um you know we as a team we do different things you know we play mini golf for our team nights out or we do like you know it's really stereotypical now i'm going to say it but we've done like pizza making classes or cocktail making classes you know so we have like a, diff a slightly different culture um in terms of like how that reflects onto our clients would i would definitely say that we're memorable um, you know, uh, people do, you know, we've got to a point now where people do tend to know kind of like who Elamed is and, and who we are as a business. I think it's also helped to shape a little bit our voice, um, in terms of the messaging. Um, I'm a big believer in, in keeping it similar to you, actually just, you know, conversational in terms of what our marketing messages kind of are. Um, and I'm really proud to say that, you know, I've got some amazing women kind of on the leadership team, you know, and, um, they add so much, so much value and, and they come up with such great ideas that I wouldn't change it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, that, that's uh, collaboration and getting along is more important than, than anything. And if you have found an all woman powerhouse team that, that does that, you know, kudos, kudos for you. Um, so, I, you know, something else that struck me is that you specialize in consulting in three very distinct sectors within the medical device space being, you know, act, actual regulators, consultancies, and manufacturers. I would imagine that's a very different personality and possibly even skill set that kind of fit in each one of those categories. How do you go about figuring out what's the the round hole for the round peg and the square hole for the square peg and etc yeah it's really interesting because like you can kind of stereotype it across um the three different verticals but equally you do get these kind of gems right who who can actually you know work across across all of them i would say um in terms of kind of like what we notice a lot of it depends on the role obviously that that they're in as well but if we're taking the role of you know a, a kind of a technical expert from personality perspective, um, the differences that I see are very much um, in size of company as well. So if we talk about uh, notify body, for example, or regulators, let's say like that, 
um, typically they're very, in, you know, we're looking for people who have um, typically uh, technical backgrounds, you know, but also um, a strong eye for compliance and um, are a little bit more, let's say, looking towards directly, um, you know, what are the requirements versus, you know, what are we having right now? And really being able to kind of like tick that box and um, to hold a very firm stance and to be able to take decisions based on risk. Um, mm. That's really something that we see a lot uh, when it comes to, you know, regulators and, and roles within, um, you know, notified bodies or competent authorities. When it comes to um, manufacturers, there's also a big distinction between company size. Because if you're recruiting for a big corporate company, what you look for, you know, is more kind of you're looking for somebody who's typically very expert in one specific area rather than more of a generalist profile. You might look for somebody that has a lot of, you know, um, registration experience in a certain country, for example, because in the big companies, um, the role of regulatory or quality um, gets split into multiple different teams that look after different areas. So there you tend to look for from an expert level, somebody who truly is an expert in the area that they've worked on um, and, and demonstrated expertise specifically doing that. And from a leadership perspective, it's stuff like being able to manage corporate politics, being able to influence people that don't directly report to you, being able to um, lead through a matrix environment. Um, in, a little bit different in a startup. So in a startup, what you're looking for is somebody who's hands on, who's unafraid to jump in, you know, somebody who's able to to really quickly pivot if something is not going, you know, as needed, uh, somebody who's able to quickly respond to that and um, being able to come up with solutions. Problem solving is a huge thing, um, you know, in startups, but also someone who's a fast learner because you're constantly learning in a startup environment. And um, if if, you know, Bob next to you doesn't have the expertise, you better find out how to do it because there's no one else. So, so typically in a startup, that's kind of a little bit more, you know, what you look for. And then when it comes to kind of consultancy, that problem solving thing is huge, right? So then what you're looking for is somebody who is truly an expert. So truly has demonstrated um, experience solving specific problems. Um, somebody who has, you know, a good understanding of, you know, what a customer is. And so therefore is able to come up with solutions, um, to, to help meet a customer need um, a little bit more uh, uh, client relationship management you know with with the consultant um, if the con if the consultant um, is what we call a little bit more 360 they need to also be able to do some business development you know actually be able to kind of sell you know solutions um, even if it's not a hard sell as a kind of sales role they need to be able to understand you know what what service can I offer in relation to what the, what is the need here um, and so the personalities can be quite different, but you do get some people that can work very well across all three. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take that question back to the context of your own team. Yeah. So, you know, you've already talked about the importance of knowing the, the, in, the, the person's personality and what that means they'd be a good fit for. How did you take all of those factors into, um, uh, consideration when you were staffing your own team? So um, we recently started to uh, develop, well, there's a, a framework called social styles. It's like four major personality types. Um, and we basically, everybody took the personality test to see kind of like, where do we fit on that spectrum? So you have your, your drivers who are kind of like your red people who are, you know, typically the people that are really pushing things through, you know, um, quite aggressive in their approach, but, you know, quite dynamic. You have your expressives that are like your really yellow people that are great at working with people and coming up with ideas. And they're, they're the people that will, you know, um, you know, always hang around the coffee machine and, and they'll talk to anyone, you know. Um, you have your analyticals who might be more kind of having the technical background and being able to look at data um, and review data. And they're the kind of people that will, um, you know, never make a decision on an impulse, but always want to review something and then, you know, breathe and then make a decision. And then you have also your aimables who are, you know, the, 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 the people who are basically the glue that bring the team together. Right. Mm -hmm. And so first it was like understanding who are we, you know, within, within the company, like who is what, you know, and then making sure like, do we have the right people in the right roles? And um, if not, let's make some adjustments there. You know, I think um, if we look at, 
from a recruitment perspective, you know, in the leadership team, everybody needs to have a bit of driver in them, right? Because the leadership team, it's all about, um, you know, obviously driving forwards the business. Um, it might not be a surprise to you, but I came out, I think I was like 80 something percent driver red. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, we have um, a really nice blend. And then obviously in marketing, um, we have a really nice blend of um, the uh, expressive, you know, the creative, as well as the analytical in um, my marketing manager. Um, and also my associate director, you know, she's, she's very data driven, but she's also got a bit of driver to her. Um, in the consultants, so the recruitment consultants, what we look for is uh, typically, you know, expressive uh, type of personality. So good relationship builders, good at um, speaking with people, you know, able to build rapport, able to understand what they need um, and be able to really make a match. And also um, we look for the ability, you know, the analytical ability, right? So being able to actually kind of read a CV, interpret the data, um, you know, read a, a, a technical job description and really understand what the client needs. Um, and so now we use that as part of our interview process. So um, when we're bringing people through the business or interviewing them, we're actually also looking into, you know, what personality do they tend to fall in and what traits do we see? And it's not the key decision making factor, but it helps you have a better conversation around some something at interview stage because you can say, OK, well, you responded to this scenario. You said that you would typically respond in this way, you know, like, why would you do that? Or, you know, how would you do that? Or, you know, it helps you really to understand a little bit better um, if you know, because the secret to recruitment is putting the right people in the right roles. Mm -hmm. If you have the right people in your business, but in the wrong roles, they still won't be successful. Mm -hmm. So it's about really being able to make that match. And um, I'm a big believer in using data and every, every tool out there to, to be able to, to make that match on top of chemistry and intuition. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, all that's important. And, you know, I think another factor on top of getting the right people in the right roles is, is like you said, getting the right balance of personalities across the organization because i saw an organization one time that was just a bunch of big drivers and a big yeah. influencers and they had nobody that was data driven that was super conscientious they didn't have any stabilizers you know and yeah. it's like okay a team of big d's can drive something right into the ditch just yeah. as much as they can drive it to where it needs to go yeah yeah um, yeah so that's totally critical. That, that's really important. That's a really important point you made as well, Michelle, because that balance is, is really important because, you know, um, what's the saying? Too many cooks. Yeah. Yeah. Too, too, too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. The so, soup. And then nothing gets done. Right. Like if you have too many drivers, everybody's directing, um, but there's nobody actually like implementing. But equally, if you have too many kind of analyticals and nobody to drive, nothing gets done, right? Everybody spends time reviewing everything and nobody makes a decision. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's been for us, that's been like a game changer, really being able to add and, and it helps you also play to people's strengths. Um, you know, it helps you motivate your team, it helps you have better conversations with them, when you understand, generally, what kind of category they fall into. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, when you and I spoke last time, one of the, the big things we, we talked about is that investing in help and overhead is probably one of the biggest hurdles to cross as an entrepreneur. Um, I know you, obviously, we've already talked about your team. How did you know it was time for your business to take that plunge? In terms of recruiting? Uh, well, adding like a staff or, yeah. you know, a just any any type of, of technical or administra administrative help i think it just got to the point where like when the business grows you end up um at the beginning you are everything right so you're like the ceo the marketing person the admin the recruiter the legal team you basically do every role um which is which is great because you're really in the business but at a certain point, you've, I, I found myself just spending a lot of time doing a whole load of nothing, but also spending a lot of time doing the things that didn't really matter, right? So, um, you know, uh, when, when you're trying to grow a business, you need to be focusing on revenue generating activities, basically, right? You need to be focusing on speaking with your clients, speaking with uh, candidates, uh, making matches, working on projects, but not spending your time on, you know, um, email alerts or, you know, creating spreadsheets, you know, that's not what going to help your business grow. And so it got to a point where I realized I was spending way too much time 
on the things that didn't really matter and not enough time on the key uh, on the key activities that were actually the ones that were going to drive the business forwards. And so after feeling like really, really stressed um, and kind of frustrated that the business wasn't going you know, fast enough, uh, I can't remember where I got this advice, but somebody said to me, just write a list of like everything you do over the course of a week. And so um, I did that over the course of a week. I literally just had a running list of every single different kind of activity that I did. And then it was like, then you need to identify what do you personally have to do as you, as you know, Eleanor, or as the CEO of the company, and what can somebody else do for you, right? And that for me was a game changer because then I basically said like, I actually only need to be doing 20% of all this list and I need to be doing that 20% 100% of the time. And the rest of this 80% of activities doesn't need to be me. And so at that point I made the decision um, to hire on a support staff. Um, and then very quickly, you know, it grew because then by doing that 20%, 100% of the time, it created more that I couldn't focus on. And so then we took the, the concrete decision to say, okay, what am I looking to build? What's the structure going to look like? What skill sets do we then need? And really hone in um, and, and go out and recruit with intent. So mm -hmm. um, that's the best bit of advice for anyone who's ever, you know, in that, in that kind of, um, you know, hamster wheel, stop, yep. advise what you do and just get rid of it. Yep. I took the plunge this year for my first official employees and it has been an absolute game changer for the business. So yeah, I second that emotion for sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the, the, the things that I was excited for you about this year is, uh, well, you've been a longtime partner with RAPS, but this year you guys officially launched a mentorship program, yeah. um, which I think is, is, is a, exciting opportunity for you on a lot of levels. Tell us a little bit more about that program and how it came to be. Yeah, so I think um, obviously this, the idea has been something that I've kind of been sitting on for a long time, um, but never really had the opportunity to do it because obviously there's just been always something else, you know how it is. Um, but obviously when COVID hit, you know, naturally we saw at the beginning, you know, a, a hit to recruitment, you know, a lot of companies, they put the hiring processes on hold or they, you know, decided that they would hire later in the year. And, you know, I, I really didn't want to, um, you know, I, I wanted to keep my team busy, you know, working on stuff. And, and so we all sat around a table and we said like, even if we can't recruit, what can we be doing that adds value to our network? And we brainstormed and came out with a, a whole bunch of ideas around, you know, the MDR group, um, you know, around uh, the podcast, around um, the Corona Chat mini content series. Um, and then one of the ideas um, that uh, Mathilde, at the time, she was like, please, Eleanor, you know, where are you getting this idea from? Um, I said, you know, I would love to do a mentoring program because, um, First of all, we have such a big network, you know, we spent years and years building out this, this network and we've got some incredible people in our network. And until that moment, we could only ever connect these people if person A was looking for a job and person B had an open role and then we connected them and then we made a match. But there's other ways to make a match where people can add value to each other. Um, so that was kind of like, you know, it, came, it was born out of COVID. Um, but the other thing is that we saw that you know, the market right now is served really, really well by big consultancies and reps also do it, you know, technical training for regulatory professionals. Um, but obviously being on the front lines and speaking with hiring managers, I know that it's not just about the technical knowledge that you have. And a lot of the time hiring managers have recruited people, not because of the technical knowledge, but because of the personality or because of the approach or the behaviors or the soft skills. And at the time, you know, we felt that there was not really anything out there in the market targeted at this specific skill set um, that is that was a little bit more uh, soft skill focused and, um, you know, uh, everything but technical regulatory affairs. So um, we decided to obviously come up with the idea, you know, of the mentoring, but actually pair it um, with three pillars. So the idea of it being mentoring and training at the same time. So you get the training. Um, so all the mentees meet once a month for different training uh, courses that they do on eight different areas. But then they go back to their so they go back to their mentors and they kind of talk about what they've learned and how they've tried to implement that, you know, on a daily basis at work. And their mentors give them the support and guidance um, in order to kind of like help push them along a lot faster. And then we have this kind of um, 
networking piece where you know all the mentees are grouped together in a group and they're all like supporting each other so you know whenever they have a little success they kind of share it and they get that moral support as well so the idea is that it was seven months like but really intense um in order to kind of accelerate the growth that you would typically see over years and years and um we're in the middle of it now so you know really excited and, and raps absolutely love the idea so you know they kind of said hey we'd love to you know get involved with this and support it and they've been absolutely amazing they're going to be delivering a couple a couple of the training modules um and um it was something that they said you know speaking with brian it was something that has kind of been on their radar but also they've never quite got to do so it just kind of made it was just a perfect match you know um so yeah really excited about that Oh, well, and you know, I think that that's going to be so valuable to the people who need to be mentored because there's so many small and mid-sized organizations where they just don't have either the bandwidth or the skill sets internally to have a, a older person mentor a younger person. I had at least two jobs in my career where I came in and the department had been destroyed for whatever reason uh either culturally it was a toxic environment for regulatory and quality people and i was too young to know better yeah. or yeah. or i took over because they had some massive the, the the it was going a new direction and they had a very small team and they wanted to grow the team mm -hmm. and in those cases even though i was still very young ish i was I came in as the leader and I, I just didn't have anybody to talk to or bounce ideas off of. So I think that that's going to be really important for the up and comers that are at, you know, kind of in smaller ecosystems. So, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Because I think, you know, um, and remember like 80% of the medtech market are small, small, medium sized businesses, right? Like the, the big yes. local corporates, they do have their own mentoring programs as well, but they are, you know, the minority, if you look at the number of companies and we do have, um, you know, people who are the only regulatory quality person in their business. And, you know, until then they had literally had nobody to kind of bounce off of or ask how to approach certain things. So having that, having that person who's been there, done that is, you know, and just a sense check is, is super important, you know, um, and, and I believe that that's generally important, no matter what you do, right? It's always important to have somebody that can help you, um, that has been there, done it, you know, even if you're the CEO of your own company, you still need somebody um, to kind of bounce with. Otherwise, you very quickly can go down a rabbit hole <laughs> and get blinkered. Um, so no, I'm really excited about and we've got some honestly, incredible people, incredible mentors, incredible mentees, you know, I'm loving kind of being part of this and, and seeing all the responses and positivity that's come out of it. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to you again. And um, I think we've got another appointment for, for that program in a couple yeah. of months. So uh, I look forward to continuing uh, our, our conversations and, and adding to the industry here. Thank you so much, Michelle. It was it was lovely to be interviewed the other way around. <laughs> I hope well, you learned something. <laughs> I know your audience is going to find this fascinating. So <laughs> I, I, I sure have. So. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Michelle. Bye.